Well, when I set out this sermon series on Galatians three months ago uh, or so, my plan was to preach Galatians 6 in two sermons. But then when I really started digging into it this week, I thought, well, there's no way I can do this in less than four. Um, I mean, there's verses one through four talk about the spiritual restoration of a believer who sins, right? So you have someone in the church, they sin, what happens next? That's there. That could be its own sermon. Verse 10, that guy just read, as we have opportunity, do good to everyone, especially those of the household of faith. I mean, that's a great sermon. That could be one. Or verse 15, where Paul says, the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. I mean, that'll preach. I mean, verse 15 is a great summary of the whole book. But then after that, he adds this great, like, you are a new creation. And so you have these, like, rapid fire thoughts or commands. And I was really wrestling with, do I slow down and, you know, take a month to go through this? Or do I keep it in my original plan and split it into two? And so naturally, I decided to wrap the whole book up today. <laughs> And do it in one sermon. <laughs> and the reason for that is these string of, of applications are really just different aspects of one overarching theme. One main idea. And while it is great to slow down, I want to make sure I'm giving you the whole picture. And it's this. Here's the, the theme of, first, uh, of chapter 6. Your life is to be a channel, a conduit for the overflowing love of God. I said last week that it, the picture is one of a, of a waterfall, right? Where God puts this mighty waterfall of his love and his provision on you and then it fills you and then it overflows. And then in reality, I mean, the Holy Spirit is living inside of you and he's the source of the waterfall of God's love being poured into you. And the reason God overflows us with love is so that it will flow onto those around us. And so your life is a, as a believer is to be focused on channeling that love, right? Okay, it's overflowing. I'm going to make sure I'm pointing to where it goes and to do so with an eternal perspective. You share the overflow of God's love in your life. And in Galatians 6, we're going to see three recipients of that overflow. So here's, here's what we do. First, we share the gospel. Second, we share our resources. And then third, we share the preeminence of Christ. And I'm going to get into who those go to in a moment. But those are the three things we share. We share the gospel, we share our resources, and we share the preeminence of Christ. And each one of those comes with this big picture, eternal, eternal perspective. Let's look at the first one, share the gospel. Verse 1. Brothers. That means brothers and sisters, right? The gathered church. Brothers. If anyone is caught in any transgression... You who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work. Then the reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load." So this is great. You share the gospel with believers. Most of the time we think of the gospel, we think of going out in evangelism or on mission trips, sharing with the lost who have never heard the name of Jesus. Here, we share the gospel with those in the church. Remember, we get saved from our sins. Sin no longer has power over us. We no longer pay the spiritual penalty for those sins. But we won't be freed from the presence of sin until Christ comes back. Which means we will still sin. And so what happens when someone in the church sins? What do we do? Do we just say, oh, it's okay, you're forgiven, don't worry about it. Oh, no, we can't do that. I said a second ago that when you become a believer, you're freed from the, the spiritual penalty for sin, which means you stand before God and he looks at you and sees you as not guilty. He sees you as innocent. He sees you as righteous. But in the present time, there are very real consequences for sin. 
When you hurt people with your sin, you're hurting yourself, you hurt other people. When that happens, there are consequences that come from it. You may lose trust. You may go to jail, right? Even though we are forgiven by God, there are still consequences on earth. And if a church does not deal with sin, not only do we face those consequences, but then we're telling the world that sin is no big deal. We look just like them, only we come to church on Sunday mornings. And when that happens, the world will not see its need for a savior if they see us acting just like them. So we can't just shrug it off and say, you know, well, I know I sinned against you, but, you know, God's forgiven me and you need to get over it too. That's the wrong attitude. Instead, we have to deal with it. And Paul tells us how here. First, it must be done by those who are spiritually mature, verse 1. This doesn't mean they're a pastor or an elder, although it could be. It just means someone who is rock solid in the gospel. They know first and foremost that they're sinners too, that they've been saved by grace, that they're depending on grace for everything. They know that they have been forgiven by the blood of Jesus, and that'll be important in this process because they go, when you go to confront someone in sin, you are an ambassador on behalf of Christ. And God's attitude towards sinners is kindness. God is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to everlasting life. His kindness is meant to lead to repentance. And so because God's attitude towards sinners is kindness and wanting repentance and restoration, if you have an ambassador on behalf of God going to someone in the church not looking for restoration, not doing it in kindness, then they're failing as an ambassador. And you put the person at risk. Back in 1999, my dad and I went camping in the Canadian Rockies. There was a group of about 20 of us, and and one day we were walking along this path um, up this mountain, and, you know, one side is mountain. The other side, it wasn't a sheer drop-off, but it was a pretty severe angle of of snow and ice. And the path we were walking across was six inches wide, and so you had to be really, really careful about where you stepped. And and uh, so they told us, you know, be careful because if you fall down, you're going to be sliding for a long time until you hit the water at the bottom. And so we're walking along, and of course, I slip, and I start sliding down this mountain. And finally, I, um, I don't know what it was, 50 feet or so, um, I had my walking stick, and I was able to jab it into the, to the snow and get enough traction where um, I stopped sliding. But then I was stuck. What do I do? I'm, I'm sitting there on the side of a mountain on my stomach. Um, I can't get up. It's too steep, and it's, it's uh, snowy and icy. And so the guide had to throw down a, a rope to me, and then they, they pulled me back up, and, and all was well. Now, if I had been hanging there on that side of the mountain by, uh, by my little stick, what if the guide, instead of throwing a rope to me, started yelling at me? So stupid. Didn't I tell you to be careful? And you weren't careful? Look at yourself now. How could you do something so foolish? Is that helping me at all? Or what if the guide had simply turned to the rest of the group and said, see what I was talking about? See? If he didn't listen. Now let's all be careful and move on. No, I'm still stuck there. The goal in that situation was to pull me up so that I wouldn't fall further. Now the guide did yell, right? The, the guide was yelling, saying, hey, here's a rope catch it, right? He asked if I was okay. Then he started yelling at all the others. You guys be careful too. We're going to have to pull him up, but we're on this little thing here. So, so if we misplace our feet, we're going to be going down as well. So make sure you distribute your weight right, right? We don't need someone else falling down. That's what Paul is getting at here in Galatians 6. When a believer falls into sin, the goal is to get them out with gentleness, which is why we share the gospel with them. The gospel is Jesus Christ died to save sinners and that he rose again on the third day to save sinners and that if your faith is in him, your sins are completely forgiven. And so we come to someone who is in sin with love and gentleness and kindness, being firm, right? But love and gentleness and kindness, pulling them up, reminding them, hey, you've been freed from this life of sin. You've been freed. You don't have to do this anymore. Now, here's grace. And the whole time we do that, we're keeping watch on ourselves so we don't fall down in the pit as well. And the temptation we face is twofold. 
First, depending on the nature of the sin, we could be tempted to join them, right? If you have someone who's sinning and it kind of looks like fun, yeah, I'm going to go help them out, right? No, you're putting yourself in danger. Or the temptation could be to turn prideful. Look at me, I'm saving your life, right? Hey, everyone, did you hear what I did? I helped them up out of the pit. Look at me, right? So verse 3 says, we shouldn't think too highly of ourselves in our process, in this process. And so, so we go in gently, humbly, calling on them to remember Christ's sacrifice for their sins, reminding them that they're new creatures in Christ, urging them to repent. We share the gospel with them. We never, ever outgrow our need for the gospel. Now, the whole idea behind all of this is the call, in verse 2, to bear one another's burdens. We as Christians are one body, and so when one part is hurt, the whole part is hurt. And being part of the body, the church, means when one person is hurting, the whole church is hurting, which is why we have to address the sin. I warn people in our membership class that if you join the church, you're basically giving the church the right to be all up in your business, right? Now, that, that may be a bit of an overstatement, but joining a church means, hey, I am getting together in this body with you. We are part of each other. Now, that doesn't mean we're busybodies, right? Always going around looking for someone to correct. If you're sitting there in bridge group and someone's like, yeah, last weekend caught me a five-pound bass, and you're like, dude, I was with you. It was four and a half pounds. Why are you lying? Right? That, that's being ticky-tacky. That's not what he's talking about. Now, you may go alongside them after bridge group and like, hey, I noticed you were bragging a lot. I mean, it's good you got the fish, but I mean, maybe tone down the bragging a little bit, right? I mean, you can address it in a gentle, kind way, but, but we're not looking for some like... Uh, uh, let me, who can I find that's sinning? Ah, there's one, right? No, 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 no. That's not what Paul means. Think about it from an eternal perspective. We are all together marching towards Christ, right? We are running this race to Christ, and we want to bring as many people with us. And so when we see someone on our team, a fellow teammate, a brother, a sister in Christ, fall, we want to pick them back up so that we can take them with us. So we, we bear that load. That's the first thing we share from this passage. We, we share the gospel with people in sin in the church, right? We bear one another's loads, bear one another's burdens. Here's the second thing. It's found in verse 6. We share our resources. Let the one who has taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone. And especially those who are of the household of faith. God's love shows itself to us in many, many ways. 99% of we're not even aware of, right? All the different ways that God loves us. I mean, what do we have that we're not given? And some are really easy to see. We know God gives us food and he gives us water and he gives us shelter. And, and we live in Texas, so God gives us air conditioning and mosquito spray and Whataburger, right? Because he loves us. But God's love provides for us everything that we need. Now we are to take that and out of the overflow that he's given to us, channel it to others. And Paul mentions three recipients. The first is teachers, particularly those in the church. And so pastors and teachers who, who give up their vocations, who give up their careers for the ministry of teaching the church. Paul's command is, if you are taught Share all good things with the teacher. Not as an employer-employee type relationship, although in our society that's what it usually looks like. Instead, it's, remember, the, over, remember the, the imagery of overflow. God in his love provides for you so that in the same vein, in the same love, you can channel that overflow to the teacher, to the pastor, so they can experience the same thing. But it doesn't stop there. 
There are two other recipients you share your resources with. They're both mentioned there in verse 10. As you have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially those in the household of faith. So this is the principle. As you have opportunity, right? Out of the overflow, God provides for you. He provides for your needs. And then out of the overflow of that, you help others. And so you make sure your house is in order. And then what's left, you use it to see, you use it to do good, to seek to do good to others. You channel it to them first, to those in the church, to those in the household of faith, but then also to other believers, to, uh, to unbelievers. Uh, I think of, uh, this is all over the pages of scripture, but I think about two in particular. First, Matthew 25. It's kind of a haunting passage, right? One day we will stand before the Lord and he's going to separate the sheep from the goats and to the sheep, he's going to say, well done, enter into the place my father's prepared for you. And this is why. This is the reason he gives, verse, verse 35. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you as a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. And so we channel the overflow of our resources to give very real practical help to those who are in need, physical needs, food, clothing, shelter, hospitality, visiting them when they're sick. The second scripture I think of is James 2.14, where James is talking about faith and works, and he says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed, be filled, without giving them the things needed of the body, what good is that? And so we are, not in order to earn our salvation, but as proof that God's Holy Spirit is living in us and overflowing in us, we channel that overflow to meet the needs of people, for all people. We share all good things. Now, to better get at this idea, I want to go back to something I skipped in the first section, because the Apostle Paul says something a little confusing in verse 2. He says, bear one another's burdens. So in that section, it referred to spiritual burdens, right? You have a brother in sin, a sister in sin. You take it upon yourself to help pick them up. But here we see that includes financial burdens as well. If someone needs the necessities of life, we bear that burden. Now, that's not the confusing part. The confusing part comes in verse 5, where Paul says, each one will have to bear his own load. So we have two seemingly contradictory statements. First, bear one another's burdens. Second, everyone's going to have to bear their own load. So which one is it? Well, in the first section, it means something like this. We have to help each other out of sin because one day you will give an account before the Lord of how you lived your life. You're going to have to stand before the load alone. I mean, you'll have Jesus with you, right? But you won't have other people with you so that you can point to them and be like, oh, it's his fault that I sinned that one time, right? No, you're going to have to bear your own load. And so to prepare you for that day, I want to do whatever I can to help you. I help you bear that load. But one day you'll have to bear it by yourself. For instance, it's become popular in our society, for some in our society, to make a public abandonment of their faith, right? They deconstruct or they de-evangelize or whatever they're calling it now. But basically what they do is they say, I'm no longer a Christian. And many times they claim someone in the church did something to them and hurt them, and that's why they're leaving the faith. And they very well could have been hurt by someone in the church. We're still sinners. We hurt people. But... When they stand before the Lord, they will not be able to use that as an excuse for why they left the Lord. They can't tell God, it's their fault. That's why I stopped being a believer. They're going to have to bear that on load. 
Now, let's take the same idea and apply it to the second part of the passage, right? You're commanded to bear the resource loads of others. If you see someone in need, you help them. But every, every believer is commanded to bear their own load. And so here's what it looks like. If you're in a place where you need financial help, food help, clothing, whatever the case may be, believers, as they have opportunity, need to share out of the overflow of what they have to help with that, right? Here you have a need, here's your need. At the same time, oh, and with that, if someone in the church comes to you and offers to help, take it. <laughs> take the help. Don't rob them of the blessing. They were like, all right, I'm going to do what, what uh, the Apostle Paul says. I'm going to channel this overflow. Here, I know you need some help. Here, Pfft. don't be prideful in that moment. Say, okay, I'll take it. Thank you. Amen, right? At the same time, don't live in such a way that you're dependent upon that help because you're responsible for your own financial situation. So, same, same idea here, right? We are responsible to help those in poverty, right? Help the poor. We bear each other's burdens that way. We seek to do good. At the same time, a person who is in poverty can't blame their situation on other people. They have to bear their own load. Do you see how those two bears coexist, right? Bear one another's burdens, bear your own load. The eternal perspective behind all this is helpful as well. Bless you. It's given in verses 7 through 9. Look at verse 7 again. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will reap from the flesh corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. And so the imagery Paul uses here when he's talking about, okay, I want you to bear one another's burdens. You've got to bear your own too. But I want you out of the overflow of what you have to channel it to others. He uses two, uh, he uses a, this, uh, this farming picture. Sowing seed, reaping fruit. And there's two types of seed he lays out here. Seed number one, fruit number one is called the flesh. You plant the flesh, you reap flesh fruit, which is corruption. Seed two is spirit. You sow in the spirit. You plant the spirit and you reap eternal life. Now, particularly in this area of sharing resources, your money buys seed. You can spend your money on temporal things or eternal things. Every time you, every time you, you give a dollar, whether at a store or to a person, right, that's planting a seed, if you spend your money and your resources planting fleshly things, you will reap corruption. It won't last. But if you spend your money on eternal things, you'll reap eternal rewards. So when you, out of the overflow that you have, the overflow of God's love, you give to those who are in need or simply you're just wanting to do good. Maybe they don't even have a need. You just want to bless them, right? That's planting spiritually. God will use your actions and your resources to bring about spiritual fruit in their life and in yours and in the lives of others who are watching. Now, in this passage, this eternal perspective is sandwiched between two commands. The first is in verse 7. Do not be deceived. Right? There's the command. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. God gave us, remember, he, he pours his love into us through the Holy Spirit, and then he overflows us. Why does he overflow us? So that we would bless others, so that we would invest eternally. And when we refuse to share with teachers, or to take care of those in the church, or to do good to those around us who aren't in the church, when we refuse to do that, we are misusing God's funds. He will not be mocked that way. Don't be tricked into thinking that God doesn't care how you spend his money. Right? Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For you will reap what you sow. God cares whether you share your resources and how. So that's the first command. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. The second one is do not grow weary of 
doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Now why would we grow weary? Because it's hard. Planting is hard work. Sharing the gospel, especially to those in the church, is hard work. Sometimes it's easier to share the gospel with complete strangers. Go, to a mission, uh, go to a, on a mission trip to a foreign country where they've never heard of Jesus. It's easy to share the gospel. Go to your family member who you argue with at Thanksgiving. It's a little bit harder. Sharing the gospel is hard. Going to a believer in the church who's in sin, trying to bear that load with them, pull them up out of the sin, lovingly, gently trying to restore them, that's hard. It costs you something. Sharing resources is hard because we see this glittering world all around us and we're like, I want some of that. But we can't give up and fall into the worldly mindset of let's live it up now because this is all there is. No, God has designed a different way for us to use and enjoy the resources he's given to us and not to make them an idol. We don't want them to reap corruption. And the best way to do that is to remember God gave these to us to do good. We need to do good. Well, um, I can see that I should have stuck with my original plan and split this up into two sermons uh, because there's no way we have enough time now to give the proper attention to this last point. And so I'm going to hold off. Um, but I want to leave you with two parting words. Maybe, maybe one word said two different ways. First, be intentional about how and where you channel the overflow of God's love. Right? God is a sharing God. He shared with us. And one of the reasons he saved us is so that we would share with others on his behalf. And so constantly put that image in your mind of the waterfall, right? God's love is poured into us like a waterfall. And out of the overflow, we're supposed to channel that. We're supposed to guide it. Be intentional how you do that. Some people try to dam it up and just keep it all for themselves, right? No, don't do that. Instead, be intentional about, okay, where, where can I... Where can I give this, right? Who can, I, who can I soak with the waterfall of God's love today, right? Be looking for opportunities to channel God's love. Or a second way of thinking through it, what are you sowing? S-O-W, not S-E-W, planting, right? What are you planting? God has given us a massive field in which he says to plant and to sow, right? And will you plant eternal things or fleshly things. And God says, no, no, you've given, I've been given you, I've given you this huge field. Use what I've given you to reap a spiritual harvest and watch how I can bless you when, when you do this. Watch who I can bless when you work my fields. So have those two images in your mind. Channel, what am I channeling? Where is it going? And what am I planting? Let's pray. <music>